the external examiner applauded and uh, his words were, I have never seen a document of this magnum opus in, a, in the area. And if there is an award, I strongly recommend it. And these were the words from the externals. So I had hold a very high esteem place for IT Kharagpur simply because the kind word I have received in the early phase of my life and career. So today I feel very privileged to be with the peers here who has uh, given me the directions or guidance and support as needed. So my dear friends, what I'm hoping to do today is a very simple introduction of a critical aspect which we all are going through. And that is that we are transforming from a regular technology based system to something that is more interconnected or digitalized in a simple word. So how does safety is going to play, is, is getting played but going to play a role in these and how to best handle it is, is what I'm hoping to talk. So I'm not aiming today to provide you the solutions or it or a method, but my core focus today would be to identify you the challenges which are in front of us together so that we could able to invest energy and time and perhaps government resources to be able to resolve some of these challenges, if not all. And I will try to show some fundamental work which um, young colleagues, uh, from institutions like yours have come and worked with me. When Professor Matthew mentioned about the publication and the impact, I do want to qualify. It is not me who write these, or it's not the recognitions of me. To be honest, it is the recognition of the young fellows from institutions like yours globally who come and work with me and make this impactful contribution. I am simply a, a teacher and I provide uh, guidance, supervision and share knowledge, whatever little I know. And that's what makes me feel happy, satisfied and often being proud of the achievement of young fellows who I also happen to share with them. So today's uh, recognition of impact is not my alone, but the young fellows like many of you who might be joining us today. With this, I briefly want to begin with a very fundamental belief, which you may not find in the textbooks or research papers or anywhere. Something that is I value core at my heart and wish to promote is that in my understanding and work and belief, the safety to the system is no different than how health is to the humans. And this is not a metaphoric, but, but in, in, in all possible technical and physical sense. To me, the safety science is no different than the medical sciences, how we teach, train our scientific physician who comes and help us to remain healthy and survive and remain productive most of our life. Safety engineers is the, the same thing. So the way I see and I work and I train my colleagues and students is to believe that the safety is no different than the health. And the challenge also of the same type. So that's where a fundamental belief need to be. The second, as, a, as an engineer, we have a further important challenge, which is that we have to measure things because if we don't, then we cannot improve. And in many sense, if you see, our physicians also do the same. They do not often measure, but they do detect or identify. And that's where they train for. So these used to be a, what we call in so far in our medical sciences is a diagnostic based approach. So if we get fall sick, we go to the doctor and then we get treated based on what is diagnosed. But in Western world, and I'm sure it is coming up in India too, 
is that now we do not have to wait to get sick to go to the doctor, but we proactively go to the doctor to get our checkup done so that we know if something is not going well as it should be so that we can prepare and plan for it. My dear friend, exactly the same happened in the, in the plant, in, a, in, 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 in the facilities, whether it's the processing plant, petrochemical plant, whether it's the airport, where the railways, it's all the same thing for me. And we need to adopt the similar approach to be able to detect major so that we know how much we need to do. Why it's become major meant to become a, a challenge for us or a requirement equally because our colleagues from industry or otherwise government, whoever is the owner of that asset, would not like to spend money unless it is proven that it's going to add value. And to do so, we do need number. In many forms, you think about, you visit a doctor, and if a physician says, oh, you're likely to have this, you're going to come out and say, well, you know, everybody's going to get something. But if the physician able to give you something in a concrete form, in form of number, then you get worried. And if a physician says, well, you better leave X habits, then you give a serious consideration. My dear friend, we need to adapt the same for our process facility, for our facility. And to how we do that is the question. So here is my very simple analog, and which is what I often teach and strongly recommend. That in order to measure safety, which is a positive term, we define as an absence of any unwanted situation or a condition, which is very hard to measure directly because we don't have a thermometer available or a meter available in our shops, which can connect to any equipment or any asset and know what is the safety. No, unfortunately. In the same way, how we do not have a meter available to measure our health. How do we quantify? For example, if I today join the army, I need to provide a medical certificate. How do it happen? Do I go and measure using a meter? Answer is no. I visit a hospital and the physician will take a range of the measurements from all the way from height, weight, eyes, and to the heartbeats and blood pressures and you name anything. Tons of indicators, tons of parameters physician will monitor on the human body. And based on these parameters will decide or give you a certificate you are healthy or not. Exactly the same approach need to be adopted for the safety. So we need to monitor a lot of parameters and then able to qualify and if possible quantify the safety. And to do so, what we take, we measure negativity because that is more quantifiable. That is more easily qualifiable. And that is what we call risk. So the risk is likely presence of an unwanted situation, which is a reasonably easy to quantify or qualify. And the way we do in the mathematical sciences is in the form of the probabilities. So we call risk to be a likelihood of a unwanted situation. So that means the likelihood, the probability play a critical role as soon as you define what is that unwanted situation like look like. So that becomes a reasonably quantifiable parameter. So if we can quantify the risk, then we have a very simple connotation that safety is inverse of the risk. So if the risk is higher, that means safety is low. And that's a very good connotation. So by using this simple mathematical operations, we are able to now directly quantify and if not quantify, at least qualify the risk of, and the safety. And that's a great, in my view, accomplishment. So go back to the physician in example. So today, if you go to the Max or Apollo or any of these so-called higher end hospitals and you get a checkup, they will eventually give you to some kind of risk factor you are posing for a particular type of disease or scenario. And this has evolved over time by the approach I'm just talking to you here. 
So these risk factors give you an indication and you take that very seriously. We need to adopt the same for our facilities because then we can be talking meaningfully for our senior executives who have to make the decision, who have to allocate the resources to do the things what expected to be done. And that's a very fundamental. So if I were you, what is the key message of today? This is the key message that how do we measure the safety? And what is the simplistic interpretation? Now, you can ask me all the fancy math, all the fancy approach, all the fancy science will go into the two parameter which is mentioned here in the calculation of risk. But that's where the research will come from. But the expression is relatively simple. So with this fundamental understanding, my friends, we now try to connect to the modern world where we are today. So we are in a connected world as we speak. We are, everything is all these days monitorable. We all are getting observed at every point of time in our own life. I Means so my family know where I am, what I am with the help of these small tools. So I can't even escape. Even if I want to run away, I unfortunately can't because, you know, one way or other, I'll get uh, located. So these things have become the reality today. While these are very helpful, but it has a danger hidden in it. And that's where I, my second important point to highlight you. That doesn't mean a lot of observation means a lot of knowledge. That's a misconnotation many of us are having today. That by having a tool like that, where you could able to communicate, it hasn't brought our hearts together closely. It has enable us to talk more or frequently to the wider distance, but doesn't mean our hearts have come closer, our relationship become stronger, unfortunately. So that's very valid. So the, the term we often use in today's time in the sciences is called, we are drowning in the data, but we are starving for the knowledge. And that's very true. So take an example that airports, every possible inch of that has been monitored. But you see often that it still things happen, which is unwanted. How come? Why? Because we tend to believe by putting cameras, putting sensors, putting this, we are safe. No, unfortunately not. But how do we try to uh, decode this whole dynamics? so that we as a scientist and engineer have a better understanding of what actually we want. So I have this very simplistic and perhaps may not be scientifically valid. So please don't cite and quote me for this. Uh, but I thought this works for me and my student very well. So I give an example of how I explain this. So for example, take a newspaper. The so newspaper is an observation. So a journalist has written what they see. So we get a newspaper, we turn the page. So we got a newspaper, we got a set of observations. But the newspaper having in hand doesn't mean I know everything. No. So from the newspaper, if I pick up a story or a news, as soon as I process that news or read that news, that becomes the data. So a specific news in the newspaper becomes the data. Now, when I read that news and able to ingest it, and the extract of that news, what I ingested, is become information. For example, please forgive me saying, we just recently, yesterday for yesterday, learned about the sad demise of our uh, army chief, uh, chief of uh, command of the So that was a news, which is the observation, then read the story that gave me the data. And from the story, you learn what has happened, where it happened, what was the time, what could the possible causes, that become the information. So remember, that is the information, that is yet not knowledge. Now, if I could able to digest that information or able to store that information in some form that I can retrieve it later, 
when I need it, that becomes the knowledge. So information that is retrievable and usable, then it becomes the knowledge. So now I can say the COGS demise is based on a bad weather helicopter crash in Uti area of uh, Tamil Nadu. That has become knowledge. Why? Because I'm able to reproduce the information. But in the same newspaper, there are hundreds of articles which I haven't have a become the data even. And some of them became the data, but never come to the information. And some of them become the information. For example, what Shah Rukh Khan is doing, maybe a data or information, but never became a retained what actually happened. And I'm unable to reproduce it. Or which movie has come uh, to the particular uh, theater. So that's a good information, but never became the knowledge. Why? Because I, I don't remember now what actually was that. So that's very important to dissect this whole gamut. Because if we could, then we can do the things better. And this we do in the area of safety, as we talked about. So my dear friends, if we talk about the asset and we use the concept we just have briefly touched upon, we might see that in the facilities, whether it's a processing facility, a petrochemical facility, or railway stations, or any other asset, we put a lot of sensor. We call these days as a process monitoring or monitoring of the processes. They generate a lot of observations. And by processing these informations, for example, putting a camera, it generates pix pixels. That is the observation. From processing the pixels, you create the data. That becomes the picture what you could able to. From the picture, when you extract a feature, that becomes the information. And then you use the information for the right purposes as a part of the knowledge. So we use knowledge in order to predict the unwanted situation so that we can able to prevent them. That is the key element. So from a knowledge to the predictive mode so that we can prevent. That is our highest priority. If we can't, then perhaps we will be able to control or mitigate. And that requires a series of steps, as I alluded with here, which often call them element of the safety. And that's are necessary. So please don't read me wrong that I'm saying monitoring is not required. Monitoring is critical. If you don't have observations, you are having a, a blank paper type of scenario. So yes, it is needed. But having something written on the paper doesn't mean it's informative. That's the message I'm trying to convey. So with that understanding that how we translate the basic observations into the meaningful knowledge and use it are the key elements. So what are the challenges we are facing that we need to overcome in order to enable our successes? So one of the first key challenge is the functionality of the time. So the concept of risk which I'm sharing with you is not new. In fact, in 90s, when I was a graduate student, I did this work early in India and for the major refineries, such as Madras Refinery Limited and others. And I cite you a very interesting quote in my early life. So I was perhaps one of the first earlier safety pupils. When I presented my study to at that time was sponsored by Tamil Nadu Petroleum Board. They laughed at the study saying, what are you trying to tell us? You're saying this will blow, that will blow, and this will blow. Why? How? It just you got an imagination? Because the models which you are presenting was overly simplistic at that stage of time, but guiding into the direction. Today, it took 10 to 15 years now since then, in a chemical plant or a refinery plant, you wouldn't move a bolt from point A to B without doing the risk assessment. But it took 15 years before what I said at the time to become a reality of today. So my dear friend in academia, it takes a while. So we shouldn't get upset or frustrated when people laugh at us. 
are you from this world? Are you, what are you talking about? And I often get that because, not that I'm any better, but this is how the life works. So my dear friend, the today's challenge is not quantifying the risk. We have good mathematics, we have powerful tools. My issue is how do we function as time? So the risk become a multidimensional, both function of time and function of space. And that needs to be resolved. The second important challenge is the scalability. So we have very good computational tools. We have very good validation possible in the lab. That's what we many of us do, I intentionally do. Because you can't publish or you can't be able to make a contribution before a bet. But nobody will give you a, your, their facility to blow up, to test verify your concepts. So we do the concept verification at a very smaller level. But then they are applicable at a bigger level is a question mark. And this question is not for just up as a safety folks or a asset integrity folks, but that is there for whole sciences. These days, as you may know, many of us are working on some molecular level. We are developing, we are studying the materials at a submolecular level and able to simulate how a corrosion happens at a submolecular level. But does this applicable? Or how does this get extended to a pipeline? This is study. That is a big question. That is a big challenge. So the scale remain to be an important element here. Second, as you already have seen, that as we open up the Pitara, the variables become umpteen. We need to monitor these and manage these. And that is a key question. Before, there could be three or four parameters which we are able to see, so we manage it. But now the three or four became 30 and 40. In today's time, they became 300 to 400 variables. So how do we manage them in order to be able to make a meaningful contribution or analysis? That's another complexity. And the third remained to be, for, remained to be the uncertainty. It means what do we know and we know <coughs> precisely because I can stand up here and say whatever I want. But how credible are these when I say a probability or a risk of 0 0.5? How much confidence does I have in that particular number? Need to be qualified. Because if we don't, then we are almost trying to become a guard, saying, oh, you know what? This is going to happen. So unfortunately, we don't have that ability. We can say this is going to happen, but we need to qualify that how much confidence do we have in that particular number or predictive to what we are saying. And if we don't do so, we are hitting ourselves on the foot. So that's another very, very important challenge in the area of safety science is the uncertainty. The last one is a very interesting and perhaps is a is a, is, a, is a kind of evolving scenario because the safety today, what was all the way till, is actually transforming very quickly into a security issue. So there is a very heavy picture, very fuzzy line between safety and security as of now. Because things what you did as a part of the safety is becoming a, a threat for security. And I will explain you what are the difference between the two terms, safety and security. But before I do so, let me explain what does it mean. So let's take an example of a traditional home. So we have home. We don't want external people to come in. So for a safety purposes, we put the doors, we put locks. Now we are using because gas, so we wanted to know if the gas is leak or not so that we can prevent it. We put the detector, we put the thermal, we put the many more gadgets in the house so that we can able to monitor and manage. So now once we did all, we now have a house which is safe because we are monitoring and we have put the things in place. We have detectors, we have a door, we have fence and we have alarm in the door. Very good. That's how most of the traditional houses are, at least most part of the world. And there's no different in these days. And we feel safe. However, my dear friend, as we are entering into the industry 4.0 or tech interconnected world, all these are great. But now people want comfort. So from a safe, we're becoming 
extra comfortable. So what we did, all these indicators, for example, door movement, heat and light indicators, or the fire indicator, all these, and now we want to interconnect into a centralized system so that I can know, I don't have to monitor all the five different things. I don't have to go from door and check if the door is locked or not. I don't have to go and see whether the, where the problem is in terms of alarm is ringing. So all of these get interconnected and then it starts to get translated onto phone like this. So I can monitor a home which is maybe a few kilometers or maybe tens of, sometimes hundreds of kilometers away. This is great. So I have from a safety, a sense of security. And we did it because we wanted to have secure home, not just the safe home. But my dear friend, there is a problem. The same thing what we did for our security purpose, these interconnected, at the red line you see, can become the weapon. So now imagine if somebody able to hide, crack into these so-called black box of interconnected world, then I will never know when somebody got in. Somebody can open the door, just like how I'm able to monitor the door from here, Somebody can able to monitor the open the door from somewhere. And people can come home and do whatever they want. People can cause an accident in the home without being knowing, without really being an accident. So safety, which we evolve to become more secure, become a problem of its own kind. So we need to understand this and try to resolve. So we need to build system that is resilient enough for such thing. So before I jump into it, I promise to explain you what the difference is between the safety and security from my point of view. So again, it's my interpretation, not necessarily aligned with the book. So the safety is an unwanted situation, correct? Absence of unwanted situation, something you do not want to have seen. But there is a hidden word, which is unintentional. So some unwanted thing, which is not intentional. For example, if you go and you drop phone, that is a, a safety issue in terms of. However, if the same unwanted event happen intentionally, then it becomes a security. So in the security definition, in my views, is absence of unwanted situation, intentional unwanted situation. So we can qualify then safety and security. Safety is absence of unintended unwanted situation. Security is absence of intended unwanted situation. And then we can quantify all these. So, some of these challenges our team has tried resolving to a certain extent. And one such approach which we have come forward called dynamic risk assessment. That approach enable a quantification of risk as a function of time. So looking into both parameters, a loss is happening as a function of time, and also the likelihood is a function of time. And this give us a very good mechanism where we could able to quantify risk as we moving into the operational life. We could do that by many different techniques, but two which we have developed and mastery over time, one is now practiced by industry as well called bow tie, where we can graphically represent through a combination of techniques such as fault and inventory, how certain basic observation or causation could cause an unwanted event. So example here, PEY, one can cause an event like C3, which is a safety threat. By manipulating P1 or observing P1 in real life, and you can able to create, you are able to then monitor how the C3 is changing. So by changing observations, you can see your risk value changing. And that is a very important. And that can also help addressing some of the uncertainty challenges as we see. Example here, we could predict first risk with a wider uncertainty. But as we get more information and data, 
we can then minimize the uncertainty because we can say more confidently based on our predictive updating, are we on the right domain or prediction or not. Other most interesting things, which is a base your network or the network based approach. It relaxes some of assumptions what we see in our previous model and to provide a better, better integrative. And that's where I, uh, many of our current graduate students are working on developing the models. So with these fundamentals, I'll try to show you does this work. So I'll tell you one, a validation which we did and second one something which we did in the lab to first verify. So we took a Macando accident and saw can or are we able to predict it? And if so, how much before getting the observation what was happening down the well on the road? Now that there's a movie available so you can always verify the facts. But this we did it well before the movie. So we can able to now model the risk based on simple bow tie concept. And that's the risk model. So you see the risk is now in a blue line here on the graph on the top. It's showing you how the risk was calculated based on the observation coming from the well bore. And most of the time till 450 in a pipe, it was all going good well beyond the acceptable limit. But as soon as the five issue, the first test failed and the, it start to get observation which was not aligned, the risk calculation is start to go higher because your variables were deviating from the expected behavior. And the more test came out negative, the risk values continue to exceed because they built the fund. And now, as you see around nine o'clock, that went vertically up and that is where the accident happened. So the argument we made that if you could able to predict just before this rise, based on the behavior we were observing in the variables, we could able to have saved. And we did that. For example, we took the smart shot and try modeling the behavior. And we could able to calculate exceedingly higher risk projected around 20 minutes before the accident. And that window can be shrinked and expanded, but it has its own cost. If you shrink it, it improves the, your uncertainty. But if you expand, you start predicting for a longer period, you will have less confidence on your prediction. And that needs to be built. So we found the 20 minutes window provided us the most confident answers. So we could say that if we would have used the observations from the plan well and calculated the risk as we regularly do, we would have known that something unwanted going to happen severely around 20 minutes before, and that would have saved a lot of life. Now, second validation we attempt to do is based on our uh, lab. So we took our one of the uh, distribution column and try introducing a defect or a fault into the system, and then use that fault to monitor and predict a the fault occurrence and second to locate where the fault is happening. And we use the nonlinear um, Lagrangian process to do so. So that's an example. We introduce the faulty data and then we are able to model using the Bayesian networks. An interesting part that once we do the processing and able to trace back, we were able to find the root cause and able to predict the example just before the accident causation. So we could say confidently that yes, if we built the model using the observations in an effective way and test verified, we can use this as a mechanism to operate our facility safely. With this, I would conclude that we have a lot of challenges in front of us as we move into the digitalized world. We do not know the solutions, but we do understand the challenges. And some of these challenges could be addressable by adopting advanced mathematical techniques with the help of 
testing and verification. And if we do so, we could be on a strong footing utilizing these technological development to enable safer operations. And when I say safer operation, it is widely for chemical facilities, for industry, for railway, highway, and you name all the system, because the science behind all these are very same. It is the operational aspect of it are different. With this, I sincerely express thanks for having me or giving me this opportunity. And I'll convey a message home that health to the human is the safety to the system. Just to reverse it so that it now convinces you that if the way we can manage our health, we can manage the safety of our facility. Thank you all, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for these good insights. So I would request Ashish to uh, please take on the Q&A. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So, <clears throat> thank you, sir, uh, for this wonderful uh, lecture regarding safety, security, and race. So, we have some of the questions. The first uh, in the chat box, I will take one by one. So, our first question is, can risk assessment be a function of space or location as well? Um, answer is yes. So the way risk is calculated today's time is a function of both the spatial variables and the temporal. Yes, it has to be because if we are not able to connect the fault to its location, then it's half a story. So I absolutely agree. And yes, the way we do risk assessment focus is to be both temporal and spatial. Yes, sir. Thank you. So our next question is <clears throat> how to model an automated dynamic risk management framework for any organization? Yeah, <laughs> that is a very highly loaded question. Thank you for asking. Uh, um, it's not easy. Uh, it mm, easy in the sense it's difficult to answer the question. Uh, the organization need to be understood and then accordingly their functionalities need to be modeled with an operation. This is not an extensive task if we have the understanding of the system means of an organization. Example is if we are organization of a four different layers and with the X number of people, um, they can easily be monitored model and then monitorable to create the observations that help building the both temporal and spatial risk management strategies. Um, it is happening as we speak in certain high risk organizations such as offshore operations and also those who are very high risk, for example, Arctic navigations or certain type of military operations. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So our next question is how to integrate safety and security in system theory? Um, there's no need for integration. Safety and security are very much part of the system theory. Um, these are just the new evolving thing it means uh, it's almost saying how do we integrate a cell phone today in our life? Do we need to? Well, this is automatically done. Um, yes, people like me or many other colleagues here would have resisted buying it for a certain time. Of, but eventually, we all start to have it because people expect us to have it. So mm, simple message is they are indeed the part of the system theory. I, mean, we, I teach them as a part of the system. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for explanation. So the next question is how to use uncertainty reasoning in safety and security tasks? Yeah, that's a very, very good uh, um, question. I mean, <coughs> yes, we do need to first understand what is the uncertainty. Because before understanding where the uncertainty lies, you can't resolve them. So in any particular operations, it's 
the first thing is you need to know what are the source of uncertainty and can that be improved. For example, if I'm predicting based on the observations I have, the chances of rain is going to be 10% uh, at two o'clock. Now I did that predictions based on the source of information I had. So it's a highly function of the information. Now the question is, so this is epistemic uncertainty. The question is, if I have more information on the same topic, will I help? Will the uncertainty reduce? Answer is yes. Why? Because my prediction is purely based on the information I have access to. So rather than having every minute data, if I could get every second data, perhaps I will be able to minimize this uncertainty. But if I'm predicting something based on a numerical model for a climate, the prediction is based on the climate model, which is based on the knowledge. And because model may have certain knowledge gap, which I can't know and I cannot improve, that means the uncertainty are remain going to be inherited in the system. That's L2. So that's where we need to understand and resolve. And if we don't, then it's a challenge. Yes, sir. Thank you for answering the question. So next question is, is it acceptable to lower risk using administrative barriers? Uh, good. Uh, yes and no because administrative barriers are not really the barriers. They are just like uh, I, you, I often say the Swiss cheese, but I'm trying to get an uh, Indian example of what it would look like. A, 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 a bread with a lot of holes in it because administrative operations are based on a penalty-based system which does not always, again, the word always is critical here, produce the desired results. So I give you an example of in a metaphoric sense. If you're driving, and this is the question I often face, in a driving, in a car, will I take a pedal brake as a safety feature? And my answer is no. Pedal brake in the car is not a safety feature, even with the latest technology. Why? Because that is meant to operate the car. That is a car's operational tool, not the safety tool. So you can't take the credit of the operational element to a safety element. Safety is some elements are those who are there, but used only when the demand arises. And that is handbrake. So handbrake, yes, can be a safety feature, but not. So on the same analogy, if you say administrative barriers or administrative layer is meant to operate the organization. If, if you take the same organization or same layer as a credit for the safety, uh, I would be a bit, uh, bit, bit worried. It's almost saying I'm a manager for operations and you make me also a safety manager. That's conflict directly yes sir thank you sir so the last question for today's session is centralizing of the data using cloud has improved the security of data storages or not answer is yes and no uh, some of us feel it's good to have centralized so that i can retrieve that's a very good thing but then it's also problematic because if somebody got able to break this cloud uh, uh, securities, then they got everything. It's almost saying all our houses, let's put together all the money into the temples so that this is a centralized location where all the money can be saved. And I'm sure many colleagues here who are very well historian uh, or have a, a, a mean exposure to history will know that this was the practice in India for link where our temples were the source of our great assets. But what used to happen, people fought to preserve that. But unfortunately, if you lose, then you lost everything. And that has happened, that is happening as we speak. So 
there is a pro, there is a con for, for this. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now I would request Professor Krishna to formally provide what of thanks to our expert speaker. Before I propose a vote of thanks, is there, is there anybody who wants to directly ask a question to Dr. Faisal Khan? Very big. Yes, so participants uh, can unmute themselves if they want to ask any question. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Khan, you have mesmerized the whole audience. I am also in this field for the last 30, 36 years I was in the industry and uh, operating various fields, operating systems, finally safety and came to IIT few years back. Uh, you you talked so nicely, so nicely. Uh, uh, did you did you work in the industries for some time? Uh, unfortunately not. Industry would not hire me because they found my <laughs> My 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 thought process to be very radical. Uh, uh -huh. No, I never worked. I did uh, serve as an advisor to Lloyd's Register uh, on okay. one of my sabbatical, but that's just uh, an advisory role. No, I'm, okay, okay. I, I, I no, fortunately or unfortunately, I was never on the payroll for industry. Uh, uh, let me tell you honestly, I don't see much difference between industry and the education. One validates other. So, <laughs> the, I, I, I keep telling Professor Maiti many times, all the academicians should work for some years in the industry. And all industry industry people should, I used to tell in Tata still when I was there, I used to tell these officers should go to institute like IITs and study for one, one or two years. So both, it will, be, it will give value addition to both. Uh, anyway, good. I did. I did. We did for some time to do it. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khan. Your lecture is very, 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 very interesting. Interesting to me. Uh, the concepts are so clear. Uh, but you very rightly reversed your own quote. Uh, safety to the system is uh, health to the human. And at the end, you reversed it very, very appropriately. Uh, your reverse and proved it that is true. But uh, can I ask you one question? In your dynamic Please. risk assessment, you said last 20 minutes, if you really analyze and control, the final incident could have, can be avoided. How is it possible? Uh, this you must have done in the lab and all those things. In the actual scenario, in the actual field, how do we do it? Okay. How is it? What, what are your thoughts? Very, yeah, very good. So I, so this study, I had a discussion with BP, with the senior executives in the, so I was not part of the review panel, investigative panel, but I did provide a, some expert views on it, on that accident. So the idea of this, particularly this case is, if, who make the call, we should proceed or not, is generally vice president operations, who are generally not sitting on the plant at the time. And in this case, was not. So what happens is, in that particular accident, when the managers of the drilling managers saw the abnormality, they do see. They provided the information to the senior executive saying, we are seeing a pressure rise, we have two negative tests. What is that why? And they do talk to the supervisors, who are the drilling supervisor, asking what is their view. They said, well, this is routine, that's happened. And these information, they combine and pass it to the boss. And the boss says, well, move on. My suggestion is that senior executives don't have time going into this. They only can see the curve. If somebody had shown them that this is what we are projecting, it, you know what he would have said? And if he would not, he would have been jailed if he would not have. Today we can't, but otherwise we could. He would have said, is stop the operation now. And that would have sealed down the operation. And the least could have done that they would have declared the May Day 20 minutes before. So that evacuation of the people would have taken place. 
because well can be shut down in, in, in five minutes call. And that is the key. So the main element which I am continue to emphasize in academia to the industry colleague, we need to provide the right information to our senior executive who end of the day are responsible and in Western world actually criminally responsible if they do not take the right decision given the information. Good. <laughs> uh, why I ask this question is, if we are working very, very seriously <clears throat> on the concept which you, you also work on the prevention through design, PTD. Yeah. In PTD, we want to operationalize the, not only on the concept, concept wise, but totally we want to operationalize all these things which you are telling. If I incorporate some engineering control, probably uh, these things could be avoided. Many many things are being put in there as the engineering control to avoid the human human interaction. But still, human is uh, cannot be taken out. So we are we are working very seriously in this concept of prevention through design and giving a consultancy to the industry scientists, giving some value addition, real value addition. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Faisal Khan. Uh, for uh, very good uh, sharing of your uh, knowledge, concepts. So it will it, it actually misled me that you have worked for many years in the industry also. So that you can understand how how forceful are your uh, your theories and comments. Thank you very much. And as Professor Maiti said, uh, we, we our center of excellence. Though though IIT Kharagpur was working on safety for many years. But formally, we want to concentrate more for the for the community and uh, industries. That's why we started the COE. Uh, probably we'll 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 be in touch with you. Uh, we will we'll work. We we take some of your your you are very much matured. Uh, this uh, your center MKO is very much matured. So we may have to take some some uh, help advices from you for the maturing our own. Goals are same. Goal goal of you and ours is also same. Thank you very much. I I request all the all the all the participants give a big hand to uh, Doctor Doctor Khan. Thank you, Doctor. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm deeply okay. in depth. Thank you. And yeah. as as you as you promised, you concluded within one hour. And thank you very much. You are very very time Thank you, time you, driven machine. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all, and we'll hope to see you sometime soon. Okay. Bye yeah. for now. Thank you.